How awesome is Jesus? Serious. Um, we looked at that list and it shot by pretty quick. I don't blame you if you didn't catch any. But seriously, how awesome is this God who has chosen to come down and dwell with us, to be among us even right now? It mentioned the Lion of Judah. It mentioned our shield, our restorer, our savior. And in Colossians, Paul tells us that Jesus is the glue that holds the entire universe together. Nothing could exist without him. Everything was created through him. Everything is for him. He is the most influential person who ever lived. Like, think about it. Um, everybody knows Jesus. He wasn't just some carpenter from Judah. He wasn't just a man who lived 2,000 years ago, influenced a couple people in his time, and left. He's the starter of, of the I think it's the greatest, the biggest religion on earth right now. And uh, the guy, the guy can't even die. I'm just saying, there's something big about that. Every superhero, take all the Marvel, take all the DC, combine them together, they don't come close to who this guy is. He is so close, and he is so intimate with each of us. Um, and yet, as we just saw in this video, everybody will fall on their knees before him. Jesus is a big deal, and we have him. And that's the key point that I want to emphasize here. We're going to talk about John, so the Gospel of John, and kind of his picture of discipleship that we see. And as you can see, it is yo-yo discipleship. And this isn't gangster, like thug on the street. This is the good old-fashioned toy that so many of us grew up playing with, yo-yos. And I would have one today, except nowhere sells them on Saturday night after 7 o'clock. Who knew? So I need you guys to imagine that there's this yo-yo present. So the passage we're looking at today is John 1, 35 to 51. So it's a nice, it's a nice long one, um, but don't worry, I have it all written out for you. So it's a long one, bear with me as we work through this, but it's important that we look at this story, because uh, it's, it's the foundation for everything that's going to happen. John tells us, the next day again, John, this is John the Baptist, not John the author, was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. 
Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. John gives us two very similar stories. I don't know if you notice the differences, but I'm going to go through it one more time, or the similarities, sorry. I'm going to go through it one more time here. John, the Baptist, is standing on the road with two of his disciples, Andrew being one of them and another unnamed disciple. We don't get to know. He didn't make the book. He looks out and he sees Jesus, the Lamb of God, and points out to his disciples, this is Jesus, this is the guy you've been waiting for. And so Andrew and this disciple run up to Jesus and they ask him, where are you staying? That's, that's their desire. They want to spend time with Jesus. They want to be with him. They want to learn from this, this teacher. And Jesus tells them, come, just come with me and you'll see. And then they come, they go. But Andrew first runs off and he grabs his brother, Simon, and he brings Simon to come and meet Jesus. Then we jump next to Philip and Nathaniel. Once again, Jesus walks up. He sees Philip. This time Jesus initiates it, so there's a little difference. He says to Philip, come follow me. Philip, uh, he's blown away by this encounter. We don't know exactly what happened, but he is blown away and runs off to find Nathanael. And he says to Nathanael, I have found the Messiah. I have found the one you have been waiting for your entire life. Everything that our faith, that Judaism is about, I have found him. You need to come see him. And I didn't change that. <laughs> anyway, so he runs out and he grabs Nathaniel and he brings him back to Jesus. And Jesus knows everything there is to know about Nathaniel. He sees him, he says, this is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel's really blown away by this. And, uh, and that's when Jesus reveals his superpower that he knows everything. Who knew? So these stories they have a very common concept, and this is what the yo-yo is. So this is me yo-yoing, by the way. With a yo-yo, it starts in your hand, you throw it down, and if you're really good, it's going to sleep there for a while, you'll pick it up, do some crazy little cat cradle trick, and, uh, and then it comes back to your hand, right? At least that's how professional yo-yos do. With John's view of discipleship and evangelism, and this is for those of you who like to sleep during church, this is the only real snippet you need to know from my sermon. So just pay attention here, and then you can nod off. But... We meet Jesus. We meet with Jesus. We spend time with Jesus. We allow Jesus to transform us. And then we go out and we find other people and we tell them what Jesus has done. We tell them who he is. And then the yo-yo returns and we bring them back with us to Jesus. And so honestly, in a nutshell, that's what we're going to talk about for the next 20 or so minutes. But as you can see, the first thing, the first thing that happens in both of these stories is that they meet Jesus. So Andrew, it's pointed out by John, and then with Philip, Jesus just walks up to him. But that's the key point. Both of them meet with Jesus, and they spend time with Jesus. And, uh, and this, is, this needs to be the same in our lives. Discipleship starts with meeting with Jesus. Meeting him initially when, when we finally realize that who Jesus is, and we accept his forgiveness, and we step into the kingdom of God, and, and we begin to become a disciple, that's the first meeting with Jesus. But there are many subsequent meetings after that. We need to continually be meeting with him um, if we want to keep living this discipleship, this evangelism that John talks about. And evangelism and discipleship are one and the same. You cannot be a disciple if you're not evangelizing. That's, that's the hard fact. The, the Great Commission, Jesus said, go and make disciples. And, um, and as you guys have noticed, this is our mission, living and leading toward God. Living, being with God, meeting with God, um, working in our own lives to try and match to be Christ-like, and then leading others to God. This is what Northern Hills Church is about. So it's a pretty, so I feel honored to be able to give this sermon. But, um, guys, if I can be so bold as to say, John is kind of giving us the ultimate meaning of life. And this is something that, I mean, societies all over, civilizations throughout all of history have been seeking for this meaning of life. And, and John's giving it to us right now. It's to meet with God. That's what we were created for. That's, we, are, we are created to be in a relationship with God. That's what we're going to spend eternity doing. Heaven isn't really just going to be sitting on a beach sipping pina coladas. Heaven is going to be us worshiping 
God, being with him all the time for the rest of eternity, which is a really long time. But that's what it's all about. And so you guys, you guys might remember, I think it was a couple weeks ago, Francis, we had a video of Francis Chan up, and he had a really long rope, like a really long rope, and it went off the stage, and then he had maybe like two inches of it with red tape, and he was just pointing out that this two inches of red tape is our life here and now, and then the rest of the rope is our life for the rest of eternity. And uh, our, the biological life here is this much of our eternal life. So once again, meeting with God, being with God, that's what we're going to be doing. That's what we're created for, why we exist. And John is telling us right now that's the first step in discipleship. By spending time with God, we get to know, we get to know how it's beneficial to other people. Maybe you guys are like me. When you see a movie that you really like, you usually go tell somebody about it, right? So the other day, I used this illustration before, but I watched Frozen for the second time a couple weeks ago, and it was an incredible movie. And if you guys still haven't seen it, get on it, because it is the best, and it'll make you feel so good about yourself. But the flip side of that is, I watch, well, actually, this isn't me, my cousin-in-law, so my cousin's husband, just recently, recently watched a movie, it's supposed to be super good. I thought it was going to be awesome. He watched the new Noah movie, and then instantly posts on Facebook. Um, this is his wife quoting him. And please don't let this tarnish your view of the Noah movie. But he says, that was the worst movie I've ever seen. I need to post something on Facebook so that people know that it's not even worth going to see to see how bad it is. Do you follow that logic? He hated the movie and he had to tell everybody about it. He put it out there to an audience of how many people on Facebook? There's probably there's hundreds of millions. He put it out to that audience, and, uh, and he had to let them know. And that's a very trivial example, and Jesus is a little bit bigger than the Noah movie. But it's the same concept. When we see God come and work in our lives, when we see the transformation that Jesus brings, how can we help but tell others about it? Right? How can Nathaniel after he's, he's just seen Jesus do this incredible thing of telling him who he is before they've even met, how can Nathaniel not go out and tell others about it? And, and each of us have these own, our own experiences with Christ, the, our own things that he has done in our lives. And honestly, that is where discipleship starts. It starts with what Jesus is doing, and we respond to that. Um, and I, also, I just want to point out that people don't need another religion piled on top of their choices. They don't need more ethical teachings, and they don't need somebody giving them a list of what to do. What they need, and John's entire gospel is based on this, is life. You see, in, in the beginning of John, he says Jesus, Jesus is life. He is the life, and he came, and, and he brings life. And when John talks about life, he says eternal life a lot. He doesn't just mean eternal life as in it stretches for the length of that rope that Francis Chan had. He means like quality life here and now. He means life the way that it's meant to be lived. And uh, Paul goes on to expand about it and talks about the joy that comes with this life. Joy even in suffering because we have this eternal life, this quality of life. And, and that's what John's talking about. We're in such a unique situation. Well, Unique, I guess, for the last 2,000 years. But do you guys remember, there's a really weird part of Matthew's crucifixion story. So it's Matthew 27. And uh, right after Jesus dies, there are three things that happen. First, there's an earthquake. That's kind of normal. Second, um, people rise from the tombs and they go into the cities and, and they start talking to their families and to people that they used to know. So if you're looking for a biblical basis for your zombie escape plan, there it is right there, zombies in the Bible. And, and lastly, um, the temple curtain is torn in two from the top down. This temple curtain, this is, this is actually the most significant out of those three things, if I can say that. But the temple curtain was the one thing that separated everybody, individuals, from the holy of holies, from the place where God himself dwelt in the temple. You see, now we know that God is omnipresent and he's everywhere, but there was something special about the Holy of Holies. So special that uh, we're told rabbis, or sorry, priests would only go in once a year. And when they did go in, they would tie a rope around their waist just in case they died while they were in there so that nobody else had to go in to get them so they could be pulled out. 
God, we have a dangerous God, by the way. He is awesome, and that's kind of a scary thing. But he also loves us, so don't worry. But like I was saying, this temple curtain was torn, and this gives us entrance into the Holy of Holies. This gives us entrance into the very presence of God so that each of us, each individual here in this theater now, can step into the throne room of God. We may not like physically step into the throne room, but we figuratively and for all intents and purposes are in the throne room of God, speaking to the Father, to the creator of the universe, spending time with him. You see, this is our modern day equivalent of, of going out and meeting Jesus. It's spending time with him here and now. Because remember, he didn't die. He rose again. And he is still alive and he's still in heaven. And we still have the opportunity to meet with him. Um, Jesus mentions in Matthew 6, 5 to 6, that we are to pray and we are to go into our own secret room. We are to go into our secret room and pray to our Father who is in secret. That didn't work. That didn't work. Do you want to help me out, big guy? Do you want to help me out one more time? Do you want to pause that? Because that's not where it's supposed to be. So, forget about PowerPoint. We have the Holy Spirit. So, guys... Jesus mentions in Matthew 5, uh, or Matthew 6, 5 and 6, that we are to go into our, our prayer closet, it's called. We are to take time to be by ourselves and to pray. And, and that's very important. One other thing that's very important, though, is we need to realize um, we, can't, we don't all pray the same way. What works for me, my relationship with God, is not the same as Scott's relationship with God. And, and we are uniquely created, and because of that, we, react, we interact with God in unique ways. Um, there's a guy, Gary Thomas, and he wrote a book called Sacred Pathways. It was brilliant material, and he, he just goes through and he points out, highlights that we are all unique. Our souls need to be tended to in a unique way. Um, we pray differently. We connect with God differently. Some of us can go and sit in a closed room, bare walls, and pray and meet God in that room. Others of us um, can meet God in walking down the street and helping someone in need, be it buying a sandwich for a homeless man, or honestly just opening the door, carrying somebody's groceries. Some of us can meet God in walking through nature and, and just seeing his creation and his glory displayed there. And there, there are lots of other ways. I won't steal all his material. He's a brilliant guy. And I can point you towards his book if you'd like, but the point is, we're unique, right? And, and when we don't pray the way that we pray, it can get frustrating, and it can seem like it's not working and we're not connecting with God. And I distinctly remember frustration. Um, we had a game growing up, and it was one of these little, uh, little board game, but there was a timer on it. Maybe you guys know this game. It was called Perfection. And... Um, little timer, and you had different shapes, and you had to fit the shapes into the corresponding slot. Unfortunately, there were some of them that looked very similar, especially to the five-year-old that I was at the time. And so you would have everything set up, the timer would be going, and it's, as it's ticking down, your stress level's going up, because you need to get it there, because if you don't have all the pieces in, it pops, and all of them go flying everywhere. It ruins all of your work. And sometimes I would come across the X and the star, which maybe don't look that similar, but when you're five years old and you don't really know what's going on, they're the same thing. And I would be trying to jam the X into the star shape. And for whatever reason, it didn't go. And I didn't really understand it, and then it would explode in my face, and I'd probably throw the game across the room and rage quit. But it was frustrating. I was trying to do something. I was trying to put the X somewhere. It wasn't made to be. And the exact same thing happens when we try to meet with God. If I try to meet with God in a, in a way that, that, isn't, that doesn't correspond to how God made me, I'm going to be frustrated and it's not going to work. The unfortunate part of this is I can't tell you how God has made you to have a relationship with him because that just doesn't work. That's something that we all get to experience. That's something that we all get to, to wrestle with and that is the adventure of, of life. Like I said, eternity is going to be spent with God. Eternity is going to be spent worshiping God. Right here and now, we get to figure that out. And, uh, and it's an incredible journey. That I, and we're all in a different place with it. Some of us maybe are at the very beginning. Some of us may have been working on it for a long time. But I encourage you to try it out. Look into it. We're all unique. 
So that's the first thing that John says. Meet with Jesus. Meet with him, be filled with him, and then go out. You found it. You're incredible. The next thing he says, go out and lead others to Jesus. Both Andrew and Philip, after they met Jesus, they went out and they got somebody, actually it was both, both of them were somebody who was special in, in their lives. Andrew went out and got his brother, Peter, and, and Philip went out and got his friend, Nathaniel. But remember, they met with Jesus first, and then they went and they, they told the others about their experience with Jesus. And uh, this is that, we're going to go to that awkward slide now. Can you go to the awkward slide? That was out of place. Here we go. So this is a transliteration of a Greek word, long story short, uh, heurisko. This is a very important word, and it's actually, it's worked its way into our culture too. Some of you, many of you will probably know this word when I explain it to you, but do um, you guys ever heard of a guy named Archimedes? Archimedes was a mathematician, a Greek mathematician, a long time ago, and he was given the task of, of figuring out if this crown that the king had was really pure gold, or if somebody had cheated them and just plated it with gold. And so he didn't really know what to do, but uh, one day he was, he was having a bath, and then he had a eureka moment, like literally a eureka moment. He realized volume and all this cool math stuff, but after he figured it out, he like jumps out of the tub and runs streaking down the street, because their bathtubs were in public at that time, and uh, streaking down, running down the street yelling eureka, which means I have found it. And so eurisco, eurisco, right here, is this word to find, to discover. And um, that's where we get Eureka from. In this passage, both Philip and Andrew run up to, to their corresponding partner and say, we have found the Messiah. I have, we have found Christ. We have found Jesus. You need to come and see him. They have a Eureka moment. And, and I want to ask you guys, have you had a eureka moment in your faith? It doesn't have to be when you accepted Christ. Maybe it was a little time down the road when you realized Jesus is actually a big deal. He really is the Lion of Judah. He really is my restorer. Maybe I need to commit my life to him. Maybe it did happen on your, at your conversion. For me, my eureka moment came when I was 16, almost 17. And uh, that's when God finally decided, Jamie, I am going to take a hold of your life and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you. And, uh, and I was like, okay, I kind of have to follow. You don't have a choice when God does, it, does this thing. But this eureka moment is, is so crucial. It's when we realize who Jesus is. And like I said, some, for some of us, it was when we were a child in Sunday school. Some of us, it's when we were an adult and somebody shared the gospel with us. But, but this eureka moment is, is the beginning of our story with Christ. Um, and it's very important for John. He repeats the word over and over again. We have found, I have found, come see what I found. Which leads to the next thing. They say, come and see. So, um, yeah. The next thing they say is, come and see. Jesus tells Philip, or Jesus tells, sorry, there's too many people going on here. I'm confused, you might be too. Jesus tells Andrew, Come and, come and you will see. You will see where I stay. And more importantly, you will see me. You will spend time with me. Philip does the same thing to Nathaniel. Come and you will see. Come with me and experience Jesus. Jesus is still working. He is still present. Remember, Jesus knew absolutely everything there was to know about Nathaniel before he even met him. He is so intimately involved in Nathaniel's life. He knew that Nathaniel was sitting under a fig tree. He knew Nathaniel was going, to be, was going to be brought to him by Philip. He knows all these things about you too. He knows, it's, let me just say, it's no mistake that all of us are in this theater today. Jesus, it's kind of weird, and it's, hard, it's a hard wrestle that we have of, of figuring out the sovereignty of God and how God controls everything, and yet we still have a free will and we can still make our own choices. But he definitely knew we were all going to be here. He definitely knew that the PowerPoint was going to be a little wonky for me. And he definitely knew that this sermon was going to be preached. He's a pretty big God. And, uh, and remember, because of how good he is, we don't, we don't really need to convince people that he exists. We don't need to convince people with rational arguments. 
we can let Jesus do that. Because remember, he exists. He's sitting at the right hand of God, and he is still doing work in our lives. Think about this table. I don't believe that this table's real because I can look at it and rationally say, well, my water bottle's sitting on top of it, my Bible's there, and so is my tablet, it, so the table must be real. I'm not, it's not a fake table. No, I walk up to it and I smack it, and that's how I know the table's real. Do you guys think it can be the same thing with Jesus? If Jesus is real, if he is living, if he is at the right hand of God, we should be able to see that. We should be able to experience that. And I think we do, because he's real. I can't walk through this screen, because this screen is real. Jesus, is, he plays by the same rules of reality. He's going to work. He's going to do something. And John tells us this is why he wrote his gospel. He tells us that Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The only reason that we have this story right now is because John wrote it so that we would believe it, so that we would come and have an encounter with Jesus through his words. Um, but it can be kind of terrifying to really trust Jesus. Mostly because when we decide to trust Jesus, we give up all control. Right? The moment that we ask God for something, the moment we bring a prayer request to him, we, we have to let it go. And we have to say, God, take care of it. We have to trust his character. We have to trust who we know him to be to take care of it. It gets even trickier when, when we want to pray for non-believers. At least it is for me, and maybe some of you guys have experienced this too. Because suddenly now it's not just our own lives that we're trusting on God for. Now we're relying on him to work in somebody else's life and to not make a fool of us. It's tough. We have to trust him. And uh, guys, once again, um, Jesus is more real than this table is. I know when I put this water bottle down that the table's going to catch it. How much more can I know that Jesus will catch us when we step out in faith and we try to share him with other people? That's the big thing. Do we trust that he'll catch us when we step out for him? This is, this is a perfect way for people to encounter the love of Jesus. Praying for them and seeing what Jesus does in their lives. Letting him be real in their lives. Um, next, people can encounter Jesus through the body that he left on earth. Can we get the next one? The church. This is why Northern Hills Church exists, guys. Um, Paul is constantly referring to the church as the body of Christ. And, like, it's all over the New Testament. We are the body of Christ. We are Jesus on earth. He left. We're still here. As the church extends pe people's love, or our love, to other people, Jesus is loving them as well. There's this weird connection that somehow what the church does, Jesus does. And what happens to the church happens to Jesus. Um, we see it a lot in the New Testament. Paul talks about how the afflictions that he's suffering um, are really filling up what Christ is lacking. They're, they're Christ's afflictions. Jesus, when he meets Paul on the road to Damascus, says, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Paul's like, I'm not persecuting you. Jesus says, yes, you are, Paul. You're persecuting my church. You're persecuting my people. There's this weird connection between us and Jesus. And it, we need to take that serious. We here at Northern Hills Church need to take that serious. Because we have the opportunity to give people an encounter with Jesus, with the living Jesus. When we step out in love, when fueled by love, fueled by love, we intentionally establish new relationships with people, our vision statement, that's giving God a chance to reach out to them through us. Yeah. Being a living influence in people's lives is probably the most effective way of reaching out to them. Um, and, the, and the next one is kind of connected with that, but the next thing is his work in your life. People want to hear our stories about Jesus. They don't want our facts. They don't want... The, 
the details of our religion. They don't want our morality. They want stories. We live in a postmodern world, and story has such an incredible effect on people. We don't really care about their facts. It's easy to dismiss facts. It's a lot harder to dismiss somebody's stories of what Jesus is doing in their lives. Um, many people put up barriers when you try to share your faith with them. It's just it's a weird thing in our culture, but when we start talking about faith, walls go up. But when we start sharing stories, there's interest. When we start sharing stories, suddenly they get to know a little more of who we are, and, and that is beautiful, and that's what people want. But like we said before, the way that Jesus is working in our lives is, is what we need to share with others. My story, um, like I said before, I met Christ when I was 17. I was, or 16, almost 17. I was at a youth retreat, and, and I was sitting on a couch, and out of, out of the blue came this deep-seated desire to get up and pray. Um, I didn't want to do it. I thought if I was to get up and walk across the, the room, people would think there was something wrong with me. They would think there was a problem in my life, and my life was good. I had a very skewed view of God and what he does. But as I was sitting there, this desire didn't go away. It got stronger, and it got stronger. And I remember sitting on the couch, literally holding the cushions so that I would not go, so that I wouldn't get up and walk. But I couldn't win out. This, honestly, this struggle lasted for over 15 minutes while we were having some kind of a hangout with God time. It was pretty cool. Somebody was strumming acoustic in the background. And, uh, and here I was having this internal battle. My, my own pride and um, fears over how people would view me versus the call of Jesus. Versus Jesus walking up to me personally and saying, Jamie, follow me. And, and I had that fight. I had that wrestle for about 15 minutes. And at that point, I realized I'm not going to win this. And I got up. And somewhere between getting up and sitting down with a leader, I don't actually know when it happened or how I really came to this, but on the walk over there, I decided I want to give my life to Jesus. So this was my eureka moment. Growing up in the church uh, for 16 years, um, always, always having that influence, this was my eureka moment. This is when I realized, like, Jesus deserves my life. He is so good, and, uh, and I want to just to live with him. And so I got up, and I sat down, and, and instantly burst into tears. I, did, I don't know why. Um, try to be a tough guy, because I'm a man. But instantly burst into tears when I sat down, and, and somehow choked through my sobbing that I wanted to give my life to Christ. And the leader prayed with me there. And, and my life, and this is cool, I'm really lucky. My life hasn't been the same since. Complete change happened after I met Christ. And uh, my passions changed, and, and what I want to do with life just instantly changed. And God took a hold of me that day, and it was awesome. But, but that is my story, and that is what Jesus has done in me. And that's what I need to share with people. You know what I mean? Each of us have our own stories with Jesus. That's what we need to share with people. That's where people are going to connect when they see it's real, when they see this God isn't just sitting up in heaven, not doing anything, when they see that he is intimately involved in our world today. So you guys remember the yo-yo? But I don't have. The yo-yo of spend time with Jesus, meet with Jesus, and then go out, tell people who Jesus is, what he is doing in your lives, and then lastly, bring them back to meet Jesus. The last two are kind of together. Bring them back to meet Jesus. Let them meet him through Jesus himself, through praying for them. Let them meet Jesus through church, through other Christians who come together and, and are able to share his love. Let them meet him through our stories, through what he is doing in your life. And as we do this, we begin to live out John's view of discipleship and evangelism. It all comes down to meeting with Jesus first. So that's, that's definitely the point that needs to be stressed here. Please um, take some time this week to spend time with him personally. Because Sunday morning doesn't ca isn't enough. You can't just fill up Sunday morning, go through your week, and be living life the way that John has it. And, and we have busy lives, but it's worth it.